Hello friends to a special edition of our second video of the top 20 favorite cars and trucks of the 1950s. This is a list suggested by you guys. Because these vehicles are so interesting, we elected to break up this video into two parts. So join us now as we finish counting down the top 20 50s cars in no particular order. Number 10, 1953 through 56 Ford F-Series pickups. In the world of classic pickup trucks, particularly from the 1950s, it could be argued that nothing is more popular now than Ford's freshly redesigned 1953 through 56 F-Series models. They've been popular with the hot rod crowd ever since a famous West Coast speed shop applied scalloped flames to their 1953 F100 Bonneville push truck, and many have been lovingly restored decades after reliably serving their owners. For the 1953 model year, Ford would introduce a totally re-engineered truck for the second generation of the F-Series. Increased dimensions, improved engines, and an updated chassis were just some of the noteworthy features of this second generation. All trucks this year were advertised as being triple economy and because the cab was all new for 53, it was now being called the driverized cab in all their advertising. This term was meant to convey that these new cabs had plenty of space. In fact, enough for three men to sit in one comfortably and doors that open to nearly a full yard, to quote the catalogs. The new panoramic windshield added welcome wider visibility and new options made operating these trucks for work or personal use an attractive feature, perhaps setting the stage for the personalized truck market that's so prevalent today. All model nomenclatures of the F-Series were expanded to three numbers behind the letter F, and this remains in use to present day. The half-ton F1 became the F100, or by 1975 the F-150. The F2 and the F3 were combined into the three-quarter ton F250, while the F4 became the one-ton F350. Conventional F-Series trucks were F500 to F900. Cab-over models were renamed C-Series trucks. Although at a casual glance they all looked alike during this period, depending on the series, many outside styling components are slightly different from one model and or year to another. Enthusiasts have coveted these trucks since they were new. Now, exactly 70 years after being introduced by dealers nationwide, there's more aftermarket support for high quality parts of all kinds for both restorations or the newest high-tech hot rods than ever before. In my opinion, and because I love the Mercury brand, I think the one to have is one of the Canadian-built and exclusively marketed trucks that were branded as Mercury, but looked exactly like their Ford cousins in all regards, except for the obvious different emblems, horn ring button, grill, and tailgate. Let me know in the comments which 53 to 56 F or M series truck you prefer and why. Number nine, all VW Beetles. In Germany prior to World War II, Adolf Hitler saw how a mass-produced automobile, specifically the Ford Model T, could quickly change the entire lifestyle and infrastructure of a nation once nearly anybody could afford to buy one. It had to be affordable to buy, cheap to operate and maintain, and simple enough to fix so that owners could do much of their own maintenance. He sought to do the same in his country. He knew people would want and need a car to take advantage of the new network of roads and autobahns being built across the entire country. Financed by the membership of the National Socialist Party, the car was developed quickly. It would be called Volkswagen, translated literally to mean the people's car. Lead engineer Ferdinand Porsche, yes, that Porsche, and his team took until 1938 to finalize the car's design and ready it for production. It was officially known inside the company as a Type 1 or colloquially in Germany as Kafer or Beetle. Later, many Americans would affectionately call them bugs. First built in 1938 in Germany, plants opened throughout the world to build the Beetle and other air-cooled models 
when production finally ceased at the only plant left building them in Mexico in 2003. All Beetles were available as a sedan or a convertible with a rear-mounted air-cooled engine. Until the 1970s, all were manual transmissions as well. Many upgrades were introduced throughout the years and many other models evolved from the Beetle, but the Beetle's the one that most people remember and cherish even today. And the Beetle should be in this position because by the end of production, exactly 21,529,464 cars were sold worldwide. These cars are simple to work on, so many enthusiasts are able to do much of the work themselves that's necessary to complete a restoration. And the amazing amount of aftermarket support is utterly astonishing. Because of enormous production numbers, Raw material for refurbishment is still very good, although prices of the most desirable years and models keeps going up. Do you remember having a Beetle, or do you have one now? What's your favorite memory of owning it? Number 8. 1951 Ford Custom Victoria After World War II, we believe domestic auto manufacturers deem styling updates more important than mechanical innovations such as better brakes, softer suspensions, roomier interiors, and more. After all, a new car buyer can only impress his friends and neighbors with the exterior appearance of his car. Buyers would no longer settle for the warmed-over post-war designs seen since the war ended, especially at Ford. Ford needed a flashy model to attract younger buyers, especially since they didn't have a true hardtop model yet. In 1951, Ford introduced the beautiful new Custom Victoria which was their first production hardtop. They were deemed special enough to only have a V8 under the hood, just like the previous year's Crestliner. 1951 would be the last year of a three-year styling cycle. Even though a few years behind in bringing a two-door hardtop to market, the Custom Victoria proved immensely popular, outselling their main competitor, the Chevrolet Bel Air, by about 7,000 units. The pillarless superstructure was styled by Gordon M. Bjorg, of Auburn Core Duesenberg fame, who had come to Dearborn after leaving the Lowy team at Studebaker. Despite exceptionally clean lines, a relatively posh interior, and good performance from the reliable flathead V8, the first Victoria is often overlooked by car enthusiasts, but in the last decade has become more collectible. Another major innovation first seen in 1951 was the debut of Ford's optional self-shifting Ford-O-Matic transmission. Built by Borg Warner, this new design had three forward gears, giving it an important advantage over Chevy's two-speed power glide. So which model do you prefer, the 50 Crestliner or the 51 Custom Victoria? Tell us in the comments which one and why. Number 7. Nash Metropolitan By the mid-50s, cars were being classified by size to help consumers distinguish the many available entries. There was a compact, a mid-size, and a full-size car, along with subclassifications like economy and luxury. This was a time of radical change in the American automobile industry. Several companies closed their doors, while others merged in hopes of surviving an industry that was less and less forgiving. For independent make, Nash, times were really tough by then. Most domestic automobile makers, particularly after the Korean War, were building cars larger than ever before. All the while, Nash was evaluating the feasibility of a potentially untapped market segment that would offer a smaller, yet still stylish, automobile as the two-car family concept was coming on strong. The car would be called Metropolitan to convey how easily the car can be driven and parked in metropolitan areas of the country. The Metropolitan was designed in Nash's headquarters in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was also aimed at returning Nash to overseas markets. Management realized almost from the start that it would not be profitable to build such a car from scratch in the U.S. because of high tooling and development costs. The only truly cost-effective option was to build this car in Europe in partnership with a company that had already developed and extensively field-tested all of the necessary mechanical components. At this point, all Nash had to do was provide their in-house styling team with the job of designing all of the appearance-related components of the body and interior. Finally, a worthy partnership with the Austin Motor Company of Birmingham, England, seemed to be a good fit for both. On October 5, 1952, 
an agreement had been worked out between the two automakers to begin production of a product to be sold on both continents. After the design and engineering of the needed components were completed in America, Austin was tasked with building the entire car at their facility. This was the first time an American designed car to be marketed in North America had been produced in Europe. In the U.S., the car would be available through a nationwide network of Nash dealers who were capable of servicing them too. The new offering was made in two body styles, an attractive convertible and an equally handsome hardtop. All came with several standard features that were optional on most other cars of the era. When Nash merged with Hudson in 1954, this car would now be marketed as a Hudson Metropolitan starting in 55. After the initial minimal order of 10,000 cars were built, the engine was upgraded to a B-Series. They're known as Series 2. Curiously, the upgrade didn't include a cubic inch increase or a power output improvement. Pretty quickly, the Met received further improvements in November of 55 with Series 3 production. This time, there were many styling updates in addition to improved mechanical features. At the start of the 58 model year, AMC announced it would be eliminating both the Nash and Hudson nameplates. They would now officially be badged as American Motors products. The Metropolitan would now be simply called that and would be sold throughout Rambler establishments. During January of 59, the Met was now in transition to a Series 4. This would be a major redesign for this car with the addition of a functional separate trunk lid, a one-piece rear window, and side vent windows. The Met's eight-year production run finally ended in April of 61. Sales of the existing inventory continued until March of 62. Approximately 95,000 Metropolitans were sold, making it one of the top-selling cars to be imported during that time. Its best sales year in 1959 would convince the big three that Americans were looking for a smaller, more fuel-efficient car. Number 6. 1957 Rambler Rebel the Rambler Rebel is an automobile that was first produced by the newly formed American Motors Corporation of Kenosha, Wisconsin for the 1957-60 to 60 model years, and then again for 1966 and 7. However, the focus of this discussion is the amazing 1957 model, considered by many to be one of America's first mid-sized muscle cars way before the trend was ubiquitous in the 1960s. Introduced as a standalone model in just one body style, a four-door hardtop, American Motors surprised many naysayers with a fresh new model in an intermediate size, something the big three would not be offering for a few years hence. It was also credited as being one of the first regular production models to have a fuel injection option. The Rebel was released to the car buying public during the last month of 1956. Described by the company as, quote, a veritable supercar, unquote. This high-performance Mordor combined AMC's all-new 327 cubic inch V8 engine, putting out an impressive 255 horsepower within the new lightweight 108-inch wheelbase Rambler hardtop. This was a revolutionary new idea. Combine a large block V8 in a mid-sized car for the post-war marketplace. None of the big three had anything to put up against it. The Rebel's base price, MSRP, was an affordable $2,786. This was an economical price considering the power that was provided as a standard feature. According to respected automotive magazine Motor Trend, it was the fastest stock American-made sedan for the year. To put the power to the rear axle, Rebels were equipped with either a manual transmission with overdrive or a GM-built Hydromatic with four forward gears. Engineers also designed more performance enhancements, such as a true dual exhaust system, a heavy-duty suspension with Gabriel-made shock absorbers, and a front sway bar. In the end, American Motors was only able to sell a shockingly low number of cars. By year's end, only 1,500 Rebels found new homes. Versions of the 327, including the Rebel package, were now optional on all of AMC's offerings, but only this year. For 1958, the Rebel name continued to be seen in the model lineup, but without the 327. 
All Ramblers that were now powered by AMC's 250 cubic inch V8 were also called Rebel, now equipped with a four barrel carb and dual exhaust. Although the Rebel series soldiered on with basic revisions each year through 1960, it had only a faint resemblance to the 1957 version. The Rebel name would briefly appear for the 1966 and 67 model years and then put into permanent retirement. What do you guys think of that 57 Rebel? Let us know in the comments. Number 5. 1958 and 59 Ford Thunderbird no one doubts the impact of the first-generation two-seater Thunderbirds. By the time the 1957 cars were being developed, many in upper management at Ford, particularly future Ford President Robert McNamara, were concerned that the sales potential of this car would be limited by its ability to transport only two people comfortably. Retooling the Wixom, Michigan plant, where these totally new automobiles would be built, took a long time, but all the while the 57s were still being assembled. This explains why 21,380 cars rolled out of the factory that year versus roughly around 16,000 cars for each of the previous two years. The 58s were offered in both hardtop and convertible body styles, although the latter was not introduced until June of 58, five months after the release of the hardtop. But a big emphasis was put on providing a huge option list and almost unlimited possibilities for color selections both inside and out. The new Thunderbird was a big hit with the car buying public, racking up nearly 38,000 sales in an abbreviated model year. This would also be the first time that the prestigious Motor Trend Magazine Car of the Year Award for 1958 would be presented to an individual model line as opposed to an entire brand's line. Both new models were considerably larger than their predecessors, with an increase in wheelbase to 113 inches, mostly to accommodate the additional seat. Weight was also increased exponentially by about 800 pounds. Another big development was the unitized body construction that would make them more rigid, yet provide a more comfortable ride. Under the hood, Ford debuted its newest engine series, the FE. It displaced 352 cubic inches, and throughout its 19-year tenure, the FE would power millions of Fords and Mercuries, from docile commuter cars to fire-breathing race cars. For the 58 T-Bird, the 352 produced 300 horsepower and was available with either a 3-speed manual or an automatic transmission. Despite only being available for half a model year, these new personal luxury models, as Ford would appropriately call them, reached sales of nearly 38,000 units. Determining that there were no needed updates other than a few cosmetics and another engine option, Ford happily rolled on with a second year, second generation styling cycle. Sales increased to 67,456 units. Although most buyers ordered the standard 352 cubic inch engine, buyers could also select the new Lincoln-derived MEL 430 cubic inch engine, putting out a reported 350 horsepower. The second gen T-Bird was also continued into 1960. Tell us in the comments what year your dream T-Bird would be and what options it would have. Number 4. 1957-58 Plymouth Belvedere Fury Obviously, this car's popularity increased exponentially after Stephen King's novel Christine was made into a full-length movie by filmmaker John Carpenter in 1983. In my research, it said that 24 different cars were used during filming, and not all were Furies, as Christine was supposed to be. Carpenter also used Belvedere's and even Savoy's, which had the attractive side trim of the two upper series retrofitted by the crew. Also, both years were used for the film. During this time, the forward look was sweeping the entire Chrysler Corporation's models, Chrysler, DeSoto, Dodge, and Plymouth. The first Fury was seen in 1955, but the focus of this feature is the second gen 57 and 8 cars. They were a submodel of the top of the line Belvedere series from 1956 to 8. All were attractive two door hardtops. The Fury didn't become its own model until 1959. The 57s were completely re engineered in addition to their fresh new appearance. Chrysler engineers developed and debuted for this year their revolutionary torsion bar suspension. 
that new look and new mechanicals would help boost sales for all the different Chrysler models that year. Unlike Christine, which King specified in his novel as being red in color, all 57 Furies were only available in sandstone white, while the 58s could be had as a buckskin beige with gold anodized aluminum side trim color scheme. Additionally, all Furies had special interiors, wing guards for the bumpers, and a powerful new V8 engine sporting twin four-barrel carbs and displacing 300 cubic inches, all teaming up to produce 290 horsepower. This same engine was also shared by the Dodge Coronet. The styling for the 1958s were much the same, save for some trim, interior, and options that were available. Unless you're a real hardcore enthusiast, it's tricky to distinguish one year from the other at a quick glance. This year, a new engine dubbed Golden Commando displaced 350 cubic inches and along with many internal upgrades, produced a very impressive 305 horsepower. It seems the horsepower wars were now in full swing. In retrospect, King selected the perfect car for his story. At the time of filming, which has now been over 40 years ago, these hardtops in all three series in both years were more readily available. But time and natural attrition whittled these numbers of available projects down immensely. Do you think Christine is the most famous car of the big screen? If not, which one is? Which year do you prefer and why? Technically, she was a 58 model, but King's novel specified a 57. This was a fun car to research. Number 3. 1951-54 to 54 Nash Healey This beautifully styled sports car was originally marketed by the Nash Kelvinator Company in the United States to promote sales for their ever-declining venture, but specifically their Nash Motors division. They had an extensive nationwide dealer network, but they really needed an exciting flagship model to drive sales in their dealerships. A British automaker called the Donald Healey Motor Company partnered with Nash after Healey approached General Motors in 1949 with a similar proposal. Healey wanted Cadillac's modern 331 cubic inch V8, but negotiations soon ended. Nash agreed to supply Healey with the drivetrain from their top-rated Ambassador models, along with a Borg Warner built three-speed manual transmission with overdrive. Healey then would exchange the cast iron cylinder head with one of his own design, which gave the engine higher compression along with twin SU carburetors. This increased horsepower to an impressive for the time 125. Part of the agreement between the two companies had Nash paying off Healey's 50,000 pound banknote, which was to be ultimately repaid in assembled cars. The car was developed in record time. The exciting debut of the Nash Healey made its official appearance at the 1951 Chicago Auto Show. Incidentally, this new hybrid sports car's full name is the Nash Healey Series 25. It's said that sometime after its 1951 model year release, the Chrysler Corporation covertly purchased a Nash Healey from a Detroit area dealership. Carefully and analytically disassembling it, and submitting a detailed feasibility report to upper management of the company. All of the automakers in Detroit knew there was a small but significant market for such a car. The 1951 Nash Healey is often cited as being the first post-war sports car from a major American automaker. While it's true that the smaller independent companies may have had a two-seater sporty car available for the Nash Healey, they weren't considered to be a major player in the American automotive business. One year after the Nash Healey's less than stellar introduction, it was decided that the car would be restyled by the world famous Italian automotive styling studios known as Pininfarina. Some of the goals they were tasked with achieving was a design that more closely resembled Nash's other cars at the time, and to shed some weight in hopes of gaining horsepower. Final Assembly would now also relocate to Italy. In order to sell more cars on both continents, various Nash Healy's were properly modified into road race cars, and some were even purpose-built racers. They began to successfully compete in some of the biggest races throughout the world. The most noteworthy appearance was at the 1952 24 Hours of Le Mans race, 
where a Nash Healy posted an impressive third place finish. Not bad for a car that only had been engineered and built just one year earlier. Completed vehicles were shipped to the states for sale throughout the Nash Kelvinator nationwide dealer network. The MSRP in US dollars was an astounding $3,767, a princely sum for the time. Now powering this beautiful design was Nash's newest engine, enlarged to 252 cubes and producing a more impressive 140 horsepower. During the 1953 model year, Nash Healey also offered a coupe model along with the Roadster. Because of the original contract with Healey, Nash wanted to at least get the number of cars they were owed. But in 1954, Nash Kelvinator and Hudson Motor Company merged to form American Motors. Not much money was available to continue building and marketing such a niche market car as the Nash Healey. Now remember too that the Corvette was now in full production and the new management team at AMC had also heard that Ford was developing a new two-seater sports car, the Thunderbird, which would hit dealer showrooms the following year. It was decided to end the program and with a low production of just 506 cars, these hybrid sports cars now bring big money on the collector car market. It's another fascinating tale from the American automotive industry. What are your thoughts on all this? Number 2. Kaiser Darren The Kaiser Darren, which was officially known as the Kaiser Darren 161, or colloquially as simply the Darren, was an American sports car designed by Howard Dutch Darren and built and distributed by Kaiser Motors for only one model year, 1954. This beautiful sports car would be one of its designer's finest and last achievements. It would be the second American sports car to have a fiberglass body, right behind the Corvette. The Darren was conceived because many returning GIs that served in Europe during World War II fell in love with the many different small, sporty, two-seater cars that were seen there, and Kaiser needed to improve sales. Once the GIs got home, many purchased cars such as Triumphs and MGs to name two. From the start, the biggest problem with the Darren is that it was underpowered and overpriced. Although it was certainly a novel design and in the end quite attractive, it just didn't have the performance of similar European cars. Ultimately, factors like a lack of consumer confidence in the Kaiser Corporation, a limited dealer network, a comparatively high price, and the practicality of the door design in cold or wet climates doomed this unique American sports car to the annals of history. By the end of 1954, a mere 435 production Darrens, along with six prototypes, were ever built. The story of Mr. Henry J. Kaiser is very interesting and quite extensive, so we encourage our viewers to find out more about him for themselves. When the company left the shipbuilding business after the war, building automobiles would be the next logical step for the company. They soon discovered this would be fraught with challenges. Even though a huge pent-up demand existed, the company simply didn't have the capital nor the capacity for high-volume production to compete with the big three. It was obvious they needed an exciting new model to drive showroom traffic. Hiring celebrated automotive stylist Dutch Darren would finally give the Kaiser company what they needed. Darren immediately went to work to provide one of the most iconic American post-war designs to date. Because the car would be a collaboration, it would be named after the parent company and the chief stylist of the project. Along with Darren's trademark fender line, the Kaiser Darren's most unusual features was how the entry doors slid into the body instead of being hinged to open conventionally. To keep the door assembly as simple as possible, no side windows were built into them. Additionally, the car was equipped with a three-position removable top. The overall appearance was hailed by industry journalists as beautifully proportioned. Underneath, the Darren rode on a modified Henry J chassis along with a Willis-produced four-cylinder engine and a three-speed manual transmission. Once the prototype was ready, it was unveiled in September of 52 at the Los Angeles Motorama. Public and media response to the Darren was positive, with the Roadster dubbed, quote, the sports car that everyone has been waiting for, unquote. Later, 
at the prestigious New York Auto Show for 1953, a similar reception was received, with Kaiser announcing the car would be available by the start of the new model year. Unfortunately, production models didn't reach showrooms until January of 54, with the Corvette already being available by then. When the car was finally available, its price tag of $3,668 was even more than some well-respected luxury cars like the Cadillac 62 or the Lincoln Capri. But unlike its ridiculous comparisons to these two other class cars, the Darren came equipped with a tachometer, electric windshield wipers, a tinted windshield, wind wings, and white wall tires. Problems with the doors, the leaking folding top and side curtains, the heater, the perception that it was underpowered, and the high price tag all contributed to the Darren's unmarketability. Kaiser dealers were reluctant to order them. As Kaiser exited the U.S. consumer car market in 1955, it still had a number of Darrens in storage in its remaining facilities. Howard Darren collected as many of them as he could, along with 50 snow damage write-offs that he had bought from the Toledo plant. He offered them up for sale from his independent Hollywood, California showroom. Some cars were modified with superchargers or multiple carburation in order to improve performance. Dutch would even replace the engines of six of these cars with V8s from a Cadillac Eldorado. These were then renamed as Kaiser Darren Specials and retailed for an astounding $4,350 each. By the end of 1957, the last of the cars had finally been sold. Number 1. 1953-54 Studebaker Coupe and Hardtop in commemoration of starting its second century in business, Studebaker had much to celebrate in 1953. Begun by the five Studebaker brothers in 1852, and by the time they marketed their first automobile in 1902, they had already established a large network of distributors and dealers, ensuring that everyone in the entire country could get anything they wanted or needed from the company at their closest dealer. In my opinion, the 1953-54 Lowy Coupe is one of the most beautifully designed cars of all time. I think its beauty lies in its simplicity and how basic and proven design principles come together so handsomely. Originally penned by Studebaker Design Studio head Raymond Lowy, Robert Bork would put all the finishing touches on it to make it the masterpiece we now know and admire today. Originally, there were two body styles, both being enclosed two-door models. The body styles are either the two-door post, dubbed the Starlight Coupe, or the true hardtop Starliner. There wasn't much difference between the first two years. As seen previously, the inline-six cars are named Champion, while the V8 cars are called Commanders. In 1955, this car received a radical redesign. The flagship Studebaker this year was now called the Speedster, part of the President series. As Studebaker's development budget was dwindling each year thereafter, the design was occasionally refreshed and new models were added beginning in 1956. Do you have a favorite year and model? Well, tell us in the comments. Well, what did you guys think of our picks this time? We think that most offerings from this decade are really cool. Some are iconic, like the Volkswagen, while others are legendary, like the Cadillac Barrettes, because they were so expensive and rarely seen on the street. These top 20 list videos are extraordinarily fun to put together because they really make us consider everything that was available to the American auto buyer at the time. Even though they're a ton of work to research and produce, we learn a lot about our favorite subject matter, cars. If you had a time machine and money was not an issue, and other details one must consider when purchasing a new automobile. What year would you go visit, and what favorite Mark brand dealership would you step into to order your favorite car? What color or colors would you pick, and all the specific options on your dream ride? It's fun to dream, and we'd love to hear about what you'd order and why. Join us next Friday when we bring you a car that's beloved by car enthusiasts of all persuasions, a 1972 Dodge Dart Swinger that's mostly original and in the loving care of its current owner, and has been for many years. You're sure to love this time machine, so we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, and remember, please be careful out there.